uh, textile work. Okay. okay, you want me to start that over since you're just, you're now recording? I just, I just realized that, yes, you can just introduce yourself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, so my name is Amber Robles Gordon. I am a mixed media artist. So that ranges from anywhere between collages to in site specific installations, uh, public artwork. Um, I love working with textile and uh, large scale sculpturals uh, artworks. So I'm gonna be kind of jumping around, um, but what you see in front of you is uh, on the left. Wait, can you guys see that? Let's see. It's not, it's, we see it, yeah, we see it, but it's not. Um, right, I just well, made it the main thing. Yeah, you see it now? Yeah. Right. Okay, so the, the um, that's an installation on the left. I'm back, I won't, I won't go through all these, but this is absolutely one of the installation on the, on the far left. Then um, on the middle right, bottom right, that's me installing a work that was um, part of myself and, and one other artist that was installed at the uh, Smithsonian, the Anacostia Smithsonian uh, Museum. Um, and then the work above that is more, a more recent work um, about birth control really. And then the one on the far right corner, that is um, uh, one of the quilts that I did for a series called Successions Traversing US Colonialism. And it is, um, this particular quilt is called DC Political. Welcome to the District of Colonialism. Um, and I'll explain those a little bit later, but the one directly above that, the one that looks like it's like uh, with all the blue, that is a toffee stick installation that I was commissioned to do. It's a detail of it that I was commissioned to do, and I believe 2018 uh, for Salisbury University. All right, so I'm going to begin talking about um, what's called the talking stick. This is a, a talking stick project. Uh, this particular image on the left is called the, the installation is called Above All, You Must Not Play at God. And um, I think it was, let's see, what year? I want to say 2015. I was um, a curator and a friend of mine by the name of Mikhail Solomon asked me if I was interested in being a part of a show uh, in New York. And uh, part of the basis or the foundation of the show was to work with artists that worked in um, worked with wood. And at that point, I didn't work with wood. And I was teasingly said, you know, girl, I don't work with wood. But... <laughs> um, but to press those, press the back on that boundary, I was reading the book, um, uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And I'm hoping that everybody there knows who Henrietta Lacks is. Since I can't see the heads, does everybody know who Henrietta at Lacks is? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I was, I had heard about her life prior to that, but just hearing the detail, reading the details was just so tremendous to me. And so I, you know, I, I tend to like listen to the little signs that the universe gives. And so the, the sign that a friend asked me to be in, a, in an exhibit that handled, dealt with uh, wood and then reading that book, I decided to converge those two things. Um, and so the works I created were textile works, but they were uh, where I was weaving them through um, branches. And to me, the branches were to represent um, Henrietta Lacks DNA, uh, and very specifically the, the HeLa cells that were created. So this installation to the left is about her life and about the various um, things that her cells and how they have impacted um, our world in general, uh, and, and really the spearhead of a multi-trillion dollar industry that is our healthcare um, uh, industry. Um, and underneath it are slivers of the Hippocratic Oath. And I'm, I'm just gonna assume that everybody knows what the Hippocratic Oath is, but um, the thing about the Hippocratic Oath is that one, it was built on a very racist foundation. So, putting it underneath sticks, like one of the sticks that is called, um, one of them is called uh, without a black woman's consent. And 
yes, I'm specifically talking about without uh, without this particular black woman's consent, which is Henrietta Lacks, but I'm also talking about you know all of the women that have had something happen to them um, that was basically done without their consent. Um, and the Hippocratic Oath, one of the interesting things about it is that it's no longer required, no longer part of, uh, let's say, like a, a, a curriculum in relationship to being um, to being taught uh, for uh, becoming a doctor. But in some sense, it should be. Um, and it should be applied to or a certain standard of how you are gonna, going to treat people that you are literally hired and supposed to be um, providing a service of care or whether it be transportation or protection. Uh, think about all the realms in which we should be holding people, especially people that work for the government um, that we pay into the you know, a, a tax system to pay its employees um, and how many of them are, don't treat people uh, equally and according, or, or even worse, to treat them according to either their status, their their um, their assumed wealth or non-wealth, and or their assumed culture and heritage and the color of their skin. So I'm not only challenging like historically what was happening, what happened to this woman in this instance, but I'm happening. I'm ch challenging um, people in general about how we treat each other and why. So this, um, this talk was then, um, I did it for an art and justice series at the Museum of, of African American History and Culture in 2017. And that was amazing. I can't, I think it was like a hundred and something people that came to participate in that particular, um, and I'm sorry, I'm speaking about the, the center image that says Talking Stick Project with Amber Opus Gordon. Um, and then on the upper far right corner, that was the original works that I created for um, the curator that I spoke of earlier. And behind, so each cell, um, each of the, the woven sticks uh, represents a certain aspect of her life. Um, and so, for example, in that same image in the upper right corner, the one that's in the middle represents the actual um, cancer cells that they um, that they basically took from her from a, a, a vaginal examination. Um, and then I break down the process of how they did that and what, what happened to the cells and how they tried to hide the cells in the text behind the actual um, sticks that represent her cells. All right, so um, this is the one that I mentioned at the very beginning. This is the Talking Stick Project that was, uh, this particular installation was at Salisbury University. Um, it's the fibrous ties that bind. And what um, I was approached by a curator at the university and she, uh, their administration was approached by one of their past students um, and, you know, at the, at the end of when they graduated, they sent back a letter basically saying that these are, I'd like to share some of the, the things that happened to me while I was at your school and in your program and things that I'd like to see, you know, get better. And so I was approached um, by Salisbury University to do a, a week long um, residency and create this installation. Um, but also it's a workshop that I do because what happens when you are creating, and one of the things that artists, most artists know, is that it can be uh, healing, it can be intrinsic, it can be repetitive, um, but that, that motion, that intention uh, can also be healing. And so I take that and I take them into uh, some, some situations. In this particular case, it was absolutely about um, social justice in a sense, and in, in, in that this person was reaching back and saying, you know, you guys have more work to do within, within the, um, within the uh, program. So this was amazing. About 77 to 80 people showed up, either uh, former students, current students, staff members, um, and each one of, this, of the uh, staff people 
uh, the attendees um, created at least one to two talking sticks. Um, and the amazing thing about this process is like, cause I, I, I work through explain like the nature of talking sticks and how it, it's passed on uh, in indigenous communities and um, used to, to honor the person who is uh, speaking um, and give time and appreciation at a level playing field. Um, and it's this whole process. And at the end of it, I ask people to, um, if they're willing to donate the sticks at the end of it. And we give them symbolic meaning and all that. And what's amazing about it is, is that the process has been so successful that nobody's walked off with a stick, which just sounds weird. But what happens is that, especially in this instance, um, that they know that they can come back because they're all part of that Salisbury community um, within, because that the installation was up for about two or three years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you can, they can come back and they can see their intentions, um, see in, in, and even relive uh, part of the, the workshop itself in seeing the installation because it's in their, one of their uh, common community areas. And it was literally, I think it was like 30 by 50 feet installation. And it's so weird because of the way that um, the building was shaped. I couldn't get any better pictures in this. And I literally, I, I hired a professional photographer to get these, but, um, but it was an amazing experience. Amazing uh, uh, the way it turned out, but, uh, Okay, so I'm gonna go on. Um, and this is a more recent installation where I combined, and this one is uh, do not attempt to encapsulate or control the rainbow. And above all, you must not play a god. This was at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in, last year, actually. Okay, so this is uh, fertile grounds of minds, wombs, and of the earth. Um, and I did this in 2019 uh, uh, through a residency at a, at a project called the Nicholson Project in Washington, DC. And so what happens with the talking sticks is that sometimes when I'm having what I consider, because uh, I, I consider it a language now. Um, so any time that I want to have a conversation about, uh, sometimes bodies in general, black, black and brown bodies in general, but even more specifically, when I'm trying to have a conversation about black or women of color, um, and about how they are treated and or how they should be treated. I use a talking stick. Um, and in this one, this is literally, um, you know, fertile grounds of minds, wombs, and of the earth. And it is uh, almost, it's a three-dimensional replication of a womb, a woman's womb. Um, and in some sense, it's about my own life, but it's also about the care that is afforded to um, and, and given to Black women and women of color, uh, and specifically how, how um, whether it be anxiety, whether it be stress uh, and or even anger, um, an unre unresolved anger, re re um, appears and manifests in women's bodies. So this is about fibroids. Um, and if you know anything about women's health, you know, fibroids is not only a, a ailment that happens to women of color, although it primarily happens to women of color, but it happens to potentially, I think it's, I think the range is like 60 to 80% of women by the, by their, by the time they leave this earth have um, fibroids. However, the amount of study, uh, the research that goes into it is very minuscule and compared to what researchers tend to focus on, which are ailments that happen to males. Um, and so this is one of the things that I wanted to bring out and point out in, 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 in the narrative around this work. And additionally, if you look around the, e the edges of this work, it's uh, recycled products that um, I, my niece and I collected over probably like a three to four year period. And then we literally cut them down into circles for the installation. So in addition to um, what I mentioned before about the narrative, it's also about what we recycle, what we use, what we put into our bodies, what we use and, and the deposits that it leaves in our, in our bodies. Um, and that a woman's body is a, is a fertile ground. Um, you know, our wombs, just like our minds. And so what you put into it 
um, is important um, and it should be meaningful and, and should be treated well um, and held to a certain um, esteem. Uh, and so the, then you just have a couple of side uh, visual images of the installation. It was like a room size installation. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the dimensions of this installation. So this is um, an image from a more recent work called Place of Breath. I'm sorry, a more recent series that I started in 2020 um, called Place of Breath and Birth. And it's about my, um, it's about my own life, actually. Um, I, I was raised in uh, Arlington, Virginia, but uh, born in Puerto Rico. And by a certain age, by five or so, I basically just came home one day and told my mother that I didn't want to speak Spanish anymore. And because uh, I, I am an Afro-Latina, but I was living in Arlington, Virginia. And there was, at that point in time, there was not other Afro-Latinas or even mixture of um, cultures as there definitely are now. Um, and so I was being teased. So, um, by eight, I knew that I wanted to be an artist. And by, I'm going to skip. So by 30 something, I hadn't been back to Puerto Rico as of yet, but I knew that it was a goal of mine. And let me say this, I'm sorry. So when I, as an adult, I can look back at the five-year-old decision to tuck away my language, 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 my Spanish language at that point, or my first language, um, I can see now that it was a measure of appropriation. I'm sorry, not appropriation, but um, what is that word that I can't think of right now? Assimilation. And my five-year-old self thought that that was the easier way to be able to deal, to be able to cope with the situation. Um, in 20, late 2019, early 2020, I, I reached out to a, a um, person who had been writing about my work at that time. And um, his name was um, uh, mm, Velasquez Caloso, I can't recall his first name, but a writer, artist who lived in Puerto Rico. And I told him that I wanted to be able to, to come to PR, uh, live there for a period of time and create work and exhibit. And so um, he, began to, he said he would help if he could. And so by six to eight months later, I got a call from a gallery in Puerto Rico, um, uh, the um, Universidad de Sagrada de Corazón, uh, Sacred Heart University. The uh, curator was Norma Vila and she was interested in a solo exhibition. So at that point I hadn't created the works that I'm showing you right now, but I knew that I wanted the show to be called Place of Breath and Birth. Um, and like I explained, I wanted it to be about my life um, and kind of reacclimating myself, rediscovering uh, that aspect of my of my heritage. Um, and I wrote up a proposal, and they said yes. So this is a product of um, these are a product of of that experience, going back there for a period of time, living there for a period of time, and uh, at least initially creating some of the works there. My goal was to create uh, the whole series there, but then we, uh, a global pandemic hit the world. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you guys know, but you know, in Puerto Rico and, and many of the islands, the, the, um, the restrictions that occurred and how quickly they occurred were very strenuous and very, a um, uh, little destabilizing, you know? Um, and so there, there came a point when the governor was talking about shutting down, shutting down the air travel in the airport. And although I, you know, we knew that she couldn't technically do that, but I go, you know, snap the fingers, but it was too much of a conversation that was happening too often. And so then uh, we basically decided to, to come back to Puerto Rico and end my residency there. But these are some of the works. This one is Reflections of Self, uh, the Virgin Mary and Colonialism. This one is uh, my, my flag flies higher than yours. Um, and it's literally about the ill treatment. So the research that I did basically, you know, um, a good portion of the work is about colorism uh, and also about the ill treatment of Puerto Ricans by the US uh, government. And in that research, I basically realized that it was not just um, uh, 
Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans that were being treated in this way, but it's also, of course, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a person of color, so I absolutely know that it's also anti-Blackness, but what I realized through the, the studying um, was that it's also about uh, treatment of people of color in the U.S. territories. So at the time I was preparing for a show, a large show at American University, um, a solo exhibition, and we thought that it was only going to include these smaller works and then uh, some installations. But um, once I realized that it was also the U.S. territories, I began to go back to my, um, my curators and decided that I was going to do large scale quilts that each one of them was going to address um, the ill manner in which the US uh, treats each territory. So I'm gonna start with, so this one is uh, on the left, this one is DC political, welcome to the district of colonialism. And I see a error in my text. I hate when I find that, but I will go back and check to uh, change that later. But so at this point, I didn't know that all of the works were going to be double-sided. I thought that they were only going to be uh, one-sided. Uh, and that they were still going to be attached to the wall. But what happened is that once I realized that I was going to be giving um, a, a basically criticism to some extent, but all, all factual information or based on factual information, but it's still criticism, I realized I didn't want to leave my viewer with just that point of view. Um, and, and I felt that if I did that, I'd be also doing what the US um, uh, uh, does to the territories, which is only see them for one specific purpose and somewhat ignore the totality of their humanity. So that's when I decided that I would go, uh, uh, that I needed to do the work, need, the works need to be double-sided. So the left is the political point of view where I dissect either the territory's uh, seal or their flag. And then the right, is an image of the back of the uh, quilt, which is DC spiritual Native American, uh, which focuses on the three main indigenous tribes that were in the um, DC, Washington and Virginia area at that time. So uh, this is Puerto Rico. And on the left is the uh, Puerto Rico political and on the right is the spiritual virgin version. Um, and then this is a installation shot. So what happened when, when I decided to do the works um, to make them double-sided, it meant that you had to uh, you had to walk up to the works. You had to confront them. You had to be um, like in close relation to them, uh, which was an amazing experience. Uh, you know, at one point I thought I was going to create them so that they would have chains attached to them, but you wouldn't believe how hard it is to find. Uh, gold, uh, gold link chains that could actually hang that um, that, uh, that amount of weight and the length of them. But um, the fact that the hovering effect that happens in these works um, just gave more emphasis to the, the overall narrative, which I absolutely just was so grateful that the the space and the narrative was conducive for that environment. So. The, this is the political view, view, and you can't see at least two of the others, which are behind USVI, which is the one on the green one in the right. And then this is the spiritual view. Um, and you can't see the, the DC spiritual one, but this gives you a good view of, of the, the quilts. And so, you know, the, the exhibit was set up so that you would come in through the main entrance where, where you would see the political view and then the, the um, elevator and rear entrance, you'd come in and you see the spiritual view. So, oh, this is the version that doesn't have the details. Oh, okay. Well, um, you know, one of the things uh, that happened after um, the exhibit was up and I only have a couple more minutes and then I'll be done, was that one of the, the uh, resources that I used as I was researching about for to create these works was a book called How to Hide an Empire. And um, after the show was up, I said, well, you know what? I'm reaching out to the, art, to the author. And I did, and I said to him, I said, you know, this is my work. This is what I do. Would you be interested in having a conversation with me? 
And he, he agreed. And we, we have the conversation. It was a wonderful conversation. And what was wild about it is that, you know, he's he a busy dude. And so it's not like we had a whole bunch of prep conversations. In fact, we didn't have any preparatory conversations. Um, but once I, once I, uh, once we were on the call and I, I could hear what's amazing about it was that how interested he actually was. And um, I don't know how to explain this, but the, the dialogue was wonderful. Um, and even in his understanding in relationship to being you know, an, a, a historian and how he related to the story that I was telling was so, um, it was so powerful because in some ways, even in his own words, my example, my life was like a, a, a cross example of what he's talking about in his book. So um, now I will say the one thing I want to end this, this talk with is one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize in this body of work um, is about people of uh, people, of what, what's considered people of the greater majority. Um, and you, you know, I don't know what crosses your mind when you think about it, but the thing that should cross your mind is that you are most likely the greater people of the greater majority because the greater majority of this world is, is consists of people of color and all the ranges that, 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 that people of color means um, and that we are the majority. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize is that it was called a supra uh, national conversation, a conversation about that, it, that is not necessarily focusing on uh, where you are who you are, um, and it outgoes or out uh, out exists the natural boundaries that we have imposed on ourselves, because the way that information is presented to us, whether it be through you know grade school, uh, um, through education, through media, uh, and through our whether it be for entertainment and or our like um, information based media, it's presented to you in a way that suggests that people um, that are of European descent are, are the majority. And that's just not the case. And it hasn't been for years. Uh, and so I'm trying to um, have us begin to look at ourselves, continue to look at ourselves differently because we can have a different conversation about ourselves and then project that forward to others. All right, so should I stop sharing? Sure, thank, yes, thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. I, that's my first time seeing all of the artwork too, so that was great. Thank you. So do we have some questions? Yes, yes come, come up so she can and say hi so she can see you. And say your name. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, my name nice is Denise Oh, okay. So uh, I just want to say, first off, thank you, you know, for being here and showing us your amazing art. I really enjoyed it. Um, so my question is, one of my problems that I have is with my finished pieces. I'm not sure, like, um, price, price range, you know? So I was just wondering, like, when it comes to your, um, the, when you sell your pieces to the museums or the curators come, like, how is the negotiation process of the payment and how does that go down and how do you determine like the worth of your art? So that is one of the harder questions I think for uh, especially a person, how, how, do you mind me asking how old you are? I'm 21. Okay, and so how long have you been creating? Um, since freshman year of high school. Okay, so you know, there, there's always the view that the the uh, market determines um, or has an influence on on a product's value, um, and that is absolutely a, a portion of it. But it's also about what you contribute, you know, versus the, meaning uh, your education, your um, experience, um, and, and in, in very particular in, re in relationship to um, your exhibits and how you are able to market your work and and or uh, present about your work. It's it's the way that I like to look at it is that you're you're a full scale entrepreneur, and to some extent it's not only about just about your work itself and the aesthetic and the narrative 
Um, it's about all these other things that also build up to who you are as an artist and then the work that you produce. So um, at this point, I would say, be careful about overpricing your work because you can undercut yourself. And I would say focus more about expanding, um, looking at yourself as, a, as an entrepreneur, making sure that it's not just about, um, making sure you can talk about your, your artwork, making sure that, like for example, I was trying to figure out right before this talk, which presentation I, I was going to give you. Was I gonna give you more of an overall history of my art? work or a more condensed work where I focus on two types of languages, actually three types of languages that I create, which was the talking sticks, collage, and then working on quilts. So, and I, I'm pointing those out because you want to be able to, to, to switch either way, whether I gave you the overall history of my artwork or talking about three different languages within the body of what I've created in how many years, whatever, how many years, meaning you, you have to make yourself um, accessible. Um, you have to make make sure that you are, have a range of what you're able to speak and converse about in relationship to your work. Um, you have to make sure that you are, are knowledgeable in relationship to the techniques that you're utilizing. Um, and then your narrative, you know, it, it's not, at least in my beliefs, it's not just about um, the aesthetics, although aesthetics and the quality of what you do and how you do it is absolutely important. But this notion that you're an artist and that the curators and everybody's going to come to you knocking at your at your um, your studio, um, that can happen, but it's not going to happen just from you being in your studio and just only creating the artwork. That's a myth. So I, I know that's probably over a little overwhelming, but I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you. You're absolutely welcome. Other questions? Yes. Hello, my name is um, Layla Williams and I'm 20. I was going to ask, what do you do when, you, um, when you're in a rut? Like, you don't have the motivation to keep going. And how do you get yourself out of that? Okay. That's a wonderful question. And the reason I'm not repeating you guys' names is because I can't hear them. <laughs> So, 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 so the way you guys say your name, you're saying it really fast. Uh, my name is Layton Williams. Layton? Yes, ma'am. Okay, nice to meet you. Um, so I think that's a really good question um, and a very hard one to answer. So, uh, and I say that because that can mean so many things for different people in relationship to how they relate to their artwork. So it's not, you know, I do have points where life situations can get in the way of creating the artwork, right? Um, and, and meaning like a breakup, a breakup with somebody that I care and love can absolutely get in the way of creating the artwork, right? But if I know, and, and I say this because I've been creating for, for, and I've known that I want to be an artist through, you know, since I was eight years old. Um, but I also know that reconnecting to my art and personal practice of creating is, is part of my life energy. Um, and so absolutely, you know, there are times when life situation gets, the, gets almost like takes over. But I, I know that part of my practice, my overall spiritual and creative practice is about creating and using my, my voice through creating. Um, and so I know that charging back into that, connecting back into that is part of my, like how I keep my life energy um, at a high level. So what I would say that, you know, on, on, on the personal side, right? Your personal health, is so absolutely precious and important. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it does exist without the artwork and you need to, we're in times when you absolutely need to focus on that. And so it's hard for me because I don't know if that's what you meant by that conversation, by that question, or is it specifically when you don't feel like doing artwork because you don't have the ideas 
And maybe if you differentiate that, that will help me in answering your question, actually. I was talking about um, personal health, like mental health. Yeah, okay. Yeah, then you've got to prioritize. You absolutely prior have to prioritize. Um, my, my answer to that is like mental health is nothing to play with. It, it's like literally your lifeline. And, you know, and I'm assuming I, I, I can't really see, but you, to me, you appear to be a, a, a male of color. And, uh, and I would say this to a woman of color, period, or any, any young person, like your mental health, you, you need to be talking to people, meaning um, uh, that can mean if, if you have a family member that's, that's you know, willing and, and able and the right person to talk to, um, do that. If you have friends um, that can be there for you, and I don't mean to divulge everything because some family members and some friends, you can't divulge everything. It's not, it's not for them. But I think that all of us should be in, in some sort of counseling because I absolutely got mine, uh, a counselor. And for various periods of my life, depending on what's happening, I, you know, I, I, I've had a structured um, counseling. Um, and I think it's essential. And I say that because to some extent, you know, I don't want to curse on this, but we all have some measure of, of, <laughs> of not being right. You know, in, our, in the way that our communities, in the way that our society is set up to hide that aspect of, of yourself is so detrimental. And it's so, um, it's, I don't know, it's alarming. But all that to say, but some of those things can be connected. So for example, if you take, uh, I don't know if you sketch, if you sketch on a regular basis, um, and focus your energy on, on recharging or affirmations and things like that. Think about combining some of them. While you're sketching, focus your mind on, on training, uh, 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 repeating an affirmation while you're sketching, you know, um, exercising, you know, three to four times a week. It's, it's not just about, you know, being at a point where, you know, society tells you about in relationship to your to, to um, weight or appearance. It's about what the actual physiological process and how that affects your body when you decide to focus on, on uh, exercising, on using your muscles, exercising that, that aspect of the various muscles throughout your body. That intrinsically, you know, releases, um, not toxins, I can't think of the uh, hormones inside your body that are just made to keep you happy and in good health and in good spirits, spirits. And so when some of those things are aligned, when you're writing, when you're sketching, when you're doing things that you love on a daily basis, when you're counseling, when you have counseling, when you're exercising, all those things aligned, when they're at a steady pace, they can lead you to better health. And I say better health because the way that life, the way that our, this life and the society happens, things are going to happen, right? We all know that you, you guys are 20 somethings. You've had a whole lot of stuff that you didn't think were gonna happen, happen to you already. And you still have your whole lives to go, but it's really about how you maintain that level of self-care and self-love on the top of everything else. And when you fall down, when, when shit happens, you slowly figure out how to get back that same level of self-care, self-love, self-engagement back up to par. So I hope that, that, I know that was a long answer, but I hope that that helps. I think he appreciates it. Appreciate yes, ma'am. Some more comments or questions or thoughts on what you saw. Okay. Um, hello, my name is uh, Austin Reynolds. Um, Hi. I'm in my last year. It's nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Um, my question was, I read your bio very briefly before we started, and I saw that you got your degree in science, um, which is something that I almost did myself. Um, how did you make that transition from having a science background, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm incorrect, um, to getting oh, into yes, art? Yes. You're talking about my BS. So the B, the BS, which I think is a weird acronym. It's, no, the BS is um, bachelor's in, um, mm. oh, my undergraduate is, is actually in business. Um, but so the business degree was actually very intentional. So I, I knew that I wanted to be an artist since I was eight. 
And, mm -hmm. but there was a part of me that wanted to be more, that thought that art, being an artist was not rational. And so um, I, I don't know that it was for myself. It might've been for to rationalize it to my mother, but I knew that I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm talented. I just need to be able to run a business. And so that made me go into getting a business degree. Now, had I had done anything differently, if I could have gone back, I would have got it in entrepreneurship instead of business because business, the way that the business degree is, is structured is to run someone else's business, right? Which is, I, I wanted to run my own, but you know, you, you figure that out and you make alterations along the way. Um, but I will say, I, I actually did want to study science. I wanted to study, um, what do you call that? I wanted to study our connection to light and energy. Because through my work, I always talk about um, light and energy, and I, and I have such a fascination with it. But I, I believe, yeah, and you, you know what? So what is your follow-up question? Because there's a follow-up, there's, there's an underlying um, motive for that question. What's the real motive for the question? Yeah, how, did that, uh, how does that influence your work in the past and pretty much where you're going to go with your work? So, cause we, I see that early science kind of theme when you were talking about Henry, Henrietta Lacks. Is that something that'll come up for you in the future? And especially in terms of being, you know, a black woman, um, a black person just in different spaces, especially like you said, in territories, will that ever come up for you in your work? It comes up every day. Yeah. Because I, 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 I love, um, I love science. I love color. I love the way that um, we relate. We we color and energy, light. It moves me um, to the color that I have on. You know, with my earrings or my accessories or even the clothes that I wear. I intentionally choose. You know, um, aesthetically, um, not just in my own my own appearance, but in relationship to how and what I produce as artwork. Um, and, and so, you know, that brings up a good point about the industry itself in relationship to why artists do what we do. So I, I think that we are, you know, very connected to self. Now, some of the problem is, is like, how do you get connected to self and then connected to others and to convey that through the work? But there are little droplets of information that your world in your, in your sphere are telling you, even at this point, right? And... Um, and if you could ha harness your energy enough by the journaling, by the exercising, by, um, the sketching, you know, and it doesn't have to be, it, your sketching doesn't have to be the same sketching that I do. It can be the sketching that, you know, you do online. It can be, um, something centered, focused, repetitive that keeps you in the doing what you love and connected to it. And that continuing that process, you'll be able to find where your droplets, your droplets might not be in science, they might be in music, and then you figure out how to incorporate your art with the music, you know, along with the other, the other measures of, of what I would call self care or self health. But I still think that there's another question. If, but if, if, if you don't have the other question, that's cool, too. Um, I mean, I can think of many things are mine so expensive. Um, do you ever put yourself in a space of just complete silence and then you have like breakthrough ideas for your work? Absolutely. And sometimes it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be an incomplete science, uh, silence. It can be just in little measures of where I'm literally, it's almost like you're talking to yourselves like, okay, well, what do you want me to have from this, mm -hmm. this experience? What, what am I supposed to contribute to this talk? What am I supposed to um, or even this proposal. Sometimes when I'm, I'm doing proposals for public artwork, um, I'll have to figure out where are my little droplets of energy, droplets of information, and, and how do they relate to what I'm being asked to produce. And there are times when, um, I'm, I'm fortunate that it doesn't happen often, where, but sometimes you do have to say, wait a minute, these things are not, they're not conducive. My, my, my life energy, my, my authentic energy is not meshing with what you are asking me to do. So therefore I gotta say, no, thank you. Thank you so much. But this is not, the, this is not something that I can take on. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Definitely, I appreciate it. Thank you. We have another question. Come, would you can hear your name. 
Um, how you doing? I'm OT. Um, I'm a junior. Can you hear me? Nice to meet you. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, um, so my question is in relation to your talking stick. Um, what was the, I believe you touched on this, but did you find that the commonality between the layering of um, her different cells and the treatment of Black women to her actual experience with her family? You know, Henry L. and how her family didn't have health care. And was, yes. was that like, was that like a key thing in you like layering? Because when I think about the fusion between Indigenous culture and essentially African culture with Henrietta Lacks, was that something that she were talking about like the passing down of the discrimination um, in the field? Is that, is that why? Because I'm like, I'm trying, because I'm not an artist. So every time mm. I look at artwork, I'm always looking at it from a perspective that is either more history-based um, because I'm a history major. Um, so I'm just trying to understand like your perspective because I know you you write from, well, you're not right. You produce from your own perspective as a black woman. Mm -hmm. So is that something that it like, pushed you to infuse the two cultures together? Like, do you think you could have used another medium or um, was that something that you really wanted to talk about with the layer? It, it absolutely was, you know, um, and... So I'm just glad that there, there are people that are focusing on art, his, art history. Are you said history or art history in this, in this room? Um, history? History? He's a history major. Yes. Okay, history major. Yeah, so, okay, so first, you know, I want to address, you said that you you, you changed it and said that um, I don't write. I, you absolutely have to write as an artist. <laughs> um, that whole thing I was saying about speaking and being able to speak about your narrative and, and you know, in some sense, yourself and your product, which is the work that you do, that you create, whether that be from a public artwork, a collage, to, you know, um, a design or whatever it is you also have to be able to write about it um, and or explain it enough to pay someone else to write about it. And, and I will say to get to that point, you need to be able to write um, and, and speak about your work in general. So I, I absolutely write about it. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at this from a perspective of being you know, a, a person of, of, of Latino and, and African descent, but also, you know, when people look at me, they don't see that, that combination. They only see my brownness. And so there's also the very, very specific treatment of how people that are not color, people that are not Af uh, of African and or considered um, African-American or black, um, I, I'm coming from that lived experience that I have being brought up in Arlington, Virginia, um, which, was, which was a very interesting dynamic. Um, and when it comes to people that make, I think that make artists that make this their, their art, their career, and or that have done the work in relationship, and you don't always, it does the work always doesn't have to be done in an institution. It can be done otherwise, but we layer things. We believe in, you know, that the intersectionality of life, um, that it's, 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 it should be intrinsic. And if it's not it's intrinsic for us, then it should be, you know, intrinsic for others. Even if we got to drop it, take, feed it to them in um, <laughs> artwork for artwork or talk by talk, uh, those things are essential. So the connections that you, that you felt or uh, heard, they're absolutely intentional. Um, and, and just for the ones that I specifically mention or specifically write about and specifically harness and put into the work, um, the way that the universe works, I'm so sure that there, there are things that I missed um, and things that just wouldn't fit in. Um, but that, to some extent, that, that is the beauty um, and the breath and the power of what can be, you know, um, art and an art practice. Would you have used a different medium? Um, to convey that? that was, no, because yeah, do you think that was, say, say it again, the, la the last part? Yeah. Or do you think that wood was like the best um, the best choice. Do you think you could have made that same visual with, um, without using wood? If I, if, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I, I, I absolutely have no, um, no second, no doubts about me that I chose the right 
uh, medium to convey that information. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you got to remember that it was also it was a, a layer of a, like a web of information because it's also connected to the talking stick in general. And that is an, that's an indigenous practice that happens throughout our world um, that connects indigenous um, communities throughout. So, yeah, no, it was absolutely intentional um, and purposeful. I don't know I that really, I, would I really like another, it. Another mer a narrative. I'm sorry. I don't know that I would ever want to consider another medium for it, you know? And thank you. I appreciate what you just said. We have time for one more question. Anyone has one? No, stand up. Come on. Hello, my name is Wesley Hickson, and I'm 22 Hi. years old. Um, besides yourself, what other artists would you recommend that we look into or also, my bad, let me rephrase the question. What other artists would you say inspired you or that we should look into if we find your art interesting besides yourself? Hmm. So I have always been um, fascinated with the work of Alma Thomas. Um, and she was a um, Washington Color School artist. Uh, and she was a, a, a teacher, an elementary school teacher up until, gosh, I want to say like her maybe early 50s, 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but she did this, this, this um, geometric shape using mainly primary colors. Um, and, you know, I think the greater, the more, uh, what's the word for this? The average citizen was introduced to her work through Michelle Obama purchasing one of her works and putting it into the, the White House. If, you go, if that gives you a visual reference of, of what her work is. Um, but she, she was a tremendous woman and her work is um, absolutely uh, just stunning to me. You know, of course, from Mayor Bearden, um, who else? I think of my contemporaries. I have a list, but I don't know that I, I'm awful with names. I, I could explain their work, but I don't always remember other people's names, which is awful. But yeah, but that's a good that's a good too. And of course, I'm I'm assuming that you already knew um, Ramirez Bearden. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amber, so much for your time and talking about your artwork. We really appreciated it. Um, I think the students appreciated your hearing your story as well. And that was the purpose because we, we can read and see about artwork in a book, but it makes a difference when the artist can actually talk about, this is why I created this and this is the purpose and so forth. So we thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will be in touch with you. <laughs> awesome. You. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.